A claim you will find on the internet is that the Flood account of Genesis was originally inspired by or plagiarized from another ancient work called the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you read through the Flood account in Gilgamesh, you will find many similarities to what we read in Genesis, such as that the Flood hero building a vessel to survive the storm, releasing birds, making a sacrifice afterwards, and the gods blessing him. It is from these similarities that many suggest the account in Genesis was taken from the account in Gilgamesh or was merely the work that the Israelite authors utilized to make their version of the Flood. However, when you dive deeper into this claim, you will find that scholars note the claim of direct plagiarism is unlikely, and the truth is more complicated. The Epic of Gilgamesh is very different from Genesis in multiple ways. First, it is not an account of origins or creation. Instead, Gilgamesh is an epic that follows the adventures of the king of Uruk, who is named Gilgamesh, and the epic is divided across 12 tablets. The summary is that Gilgamesh was a king who was hated by his people, so the gods create a wild man named Enkidu to distract him. Enkidu and Gilgamesh become friends and go on adventures together, but then the gods become mad with them and then sentence Enkidu to die. After this, Gilgamesh is filled with grief and fear of his own mortality. So he goes on a long journey to find Utnapishtim, who is immortal, to ask him how he could obtain immortality for himself. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that he cannot achieve this, but that there is a plant at the bottom of the sea that can rejuvenate the body. Gilgamesh manages to get a hold of this plant, but on the way back to Uruk, he stops to bathe and a serpent steals the plant. So the epic ends with Gilgamesh accepting his mortal life and that the only immortality one can hope to achieve is to make a name for yourself that lasts through generations. So as you can see, the whole account is nothing like Genesis. But when Gilgamesh visits Utnapishtim, he learns from him about the Flood. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that he was tasked to build a vessel to survive the storm. After the Flood, he made a sacrifice to feed the gods and as a reward, he was granted immortality. It is this particular section of Gilgamesh that many argue was either stolen and added to the Bible, or it was at least what the Israelite authors used to make their own story of the Great Flood. However, there are problems with each of these claims. First, we need to point out that we don't have just one Epic of Gilgamesh. Technically, we have several fragmented accounts of Gilgamesh, and they are all different from each other. What is traditionally known as the Epic of Gilgamesh is the late version found in an Assyrian library at Nineveh that dates to the 7th century BC. Geoffrey Tige says of the earlier fragmented versions, those from the second millennium, although textually related to the Nineveh texts, differ from them considerably. The Akkadian forms of the epic attested in the second millennium texts disappear by the end of this millennium to be replaced in the first millennium by a version of the epic that is basically standardized wherever it is found and is characterized by a distinctive style. So what we can gather from historical evidence is that Gilgamesh was updated and changed over time, and there are several different versions, which show how fluid the text was before the construction of the late epic. We have found variations in fragmented Sumerian, Akkadian, Hittite, and Hurrian versions scattered throughout the ancient world. All of these appear to be older than the late complete version, and differences can be found throughout. Here are some examples. In the early Sumerian texts, Enkidu is referred to as a servant, not a friend. Fifty soldiers set out with Gilgamesh in one adventure, but are absent in the late epic. In the early version, it refers to a temple as the abode of Anu, but in the late versions, it refers to it as the abode of Anu and Ishtar. In a Sumerian text, at one point, Gilgamesh wants to travel to Cedar Mountain to establish a name for himself. But in the old Babylonian version, he wants to travel there to fight a monster to establish his name. In the late epic, this is again modified to state that it was the sun god who is the initiator of this campaign. Jeffrey Tige notes, the Bull of Heaven episode is not attested in the old Babylonian version. It is first attested in the Akkadian and Hittite texts 
from Hattusha. In the late epic, the Twelfth Tablet appears to be an addition that contradicts the rest of the story. Enkidu is alive at the beginning of this tablet, even though he dies in the middle of the story. He is also referred to as a servant in this section, which supports Tige's theory that Tablet 12 is a literal translation of an earlier Sumerian poem added to the end of the epic, sort of like an appendage for the story as a whole. There are also variations in how things are worded. Many times it appears the later Akkadian versions are paraphrasing the early Sumerian texts, instead of translating word for word. Sometimes in the late epic, sections are expanded and given more commentary, and sometimes sections are reformatted with new ideas. Sometimes there is evidence of corruption or a misunderstanding of earlier wording. There are even variations between the different Sumerian fragments. So what we read in the late version appears to be an evolved text that gradually came about after several redactions and changes. And the text itself appears to have been understood as fluid and should be modified depending on the culture and time period. Tige says, in any case, the fragments of the Middle Babylonian period indicate that the emergence of the late standard Babylonian text was a gradual process that took centuries, rather than something achieved all at once by the final editor. Some suggest the late product was originally separate works that were then compiled together into the epic, but Tige argues that is unlikely, given that the earlier fragmented versions probably reference other parts of the epic, suggesting that there was an earlier epic in Akkadian that was just being updated over time. It might be the case that the earliest Akkadian version was put together from separate Sumerian works, but we still are not entirely sure. However, Tige notes there is most likely one exception to this, namely the flood account, which he argues was most likely added to the late version of the epic and was absent in the earlier versions. The reasons are is that the flood account in Gilgamesh differs from the rest of the epic in terms of style, opening formulas, and vocabulary. The flood account refers to Utnapishtim's wife as woman, but outside of the flood account, the epic mostly refers to her as wife. The Utnapishtim sections outside of the flood account use a single formula for introducing speeches. This formula is also seen in earlier places of the epic and observed in the earlier Old Babylonian fragmented versions. However, within the flood narrative in Gilgamesh Epic 11, on the other hand, a different formula is consistently used. A opened his mouth to speak, saying to B. The Gilgamesh Epic continually uses a homogenized, repetitious style. But when it comes to the flood account, this style is used far less and only in short passages. When the flood account is over, the style reverts back to the large-scale, homogenized, repetitious style. Tige notes the likely explanation is that the flood account in Gilgamesh was not originally part of the epic, but was inserted into the late version and was copied from the flood account in a late, now lost, version of the Atrahasis. Certain lines of the Gilgamesh flood are virtually identical to lines found in Atrahasis. The opening list of gods is more consistent with the list of gods in the second tablet of the Atrahasis, and finally and most telling, the flood hero of Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim, is called Atrahasis at one point. Thus, we must therefore infer that prior to the late version of Gilgamesh, the flood narrative was not part of the Utnapishtim section, and that it was taken into Gilgamesh from a late version of Atrahasis, one dating from the time when the late formula was in vogue. Scott Nagel says, Most scholars therefore see this section, the 11th tablet, as the work of a 7th century editor who based the addition upon an earlier source known as the Atrahasis Epic. Therefore, Gilgamesh seems to be an elastic and fluid epic that changed and was modified depending on the culture and time period. The flood account was probably not in the original version, as it is not consistent with the literary structures of the rest of the epic and is not attested in the early fragmented versions or even hinted to. It most likely was added during the construction of the late version, or even at a later point but prior to it being placed in the library in Nineveh. Now given all this research, 
it can better help us compare and understand the relation between the Genesis Flood and the Gilgamesh version. The first thing to note is there is no evidence of direct, literary dependence in Genesis, like there is with Gilgamesh's dependence on the Atrahasis. As we noted, we can find literary connections between the late version of the Gilgamesh epic and the Atrahasis. This is entirely lacking when it comes to the Genesis account. There is no evidence of direct literary borrowing with vocabulary, style, or formulas. It is true there are Akkadian cognates in the biblical account of the Flood. However, John Walton and Tremper Longman note this doesn't actually show they were just borrowing from the known Mesopotamian Flood legends. As the literary arrangement in Genesis when the cognates show up do not match any Mesopotamian Flood legends. In their words, the narrative flow concerning the building materials does not specifically follow any of the Mesopotamian traditions. So although the biblical description has connections to Akkadian, it also seems to be an independent tradition that was handed down to the Hebrews that was separate from the other known flood accounts, not something that was taken from known Mesopotamian flood legends. Even Mark Smith notes, the lack of verbal agreement with parallel Akkadian texts as opposed to motifs and the relative paucity of loan vocabulary and literature, militates against a theory of direct literary dependence. With Genesis 1-11, we seem to be working more with shared motifs and basic plot lines that originated in Mesopotamia, rather than with actually known texts directly borrowed into Israel. If the Hebrews did craft the flood account by borrowing from the other known flood legends, they changed so much that any recognizable direct literary connection has been erased by the work of undetectable and clever forgers. Now, what many scholars suggest is not literary dependence, but shared traditions between Genesis and the other flood accounts. In other words, all the flood accounts are probably building off original oral traditions handed down to the later cultures. John Walton illustrates this by comparing it to the Egyptian and Hittite accounts of the Battle of Kadesh. Both cultures wrote about the same event, and so we should expect there to be similarities. But also, the religious and cultural perspective of each side produced differences as well. But the important point is that the similarities between both accounts do not mean one side copied the other, or inspired the other's account. It is more likely both accounts just shared similar traditions about something that happened in the past. We can make another analogy with the event known as the Exodus from Egypt. Both Tacitus and Manetho speak of the origins of the nation of Israel as having left Egypt a long time ago. Tacitus says the Hebrews were kicked out because of a plague, and Manetho refers to the Exodus as an expulsion of lepers. There are similarities here to what we find in the earlier account within the book of Exodus. But it is unlikely Tacitus or Manetho got their information from the Pentateuch. It is more likely they are citing an earlier Egyptian version of their side of the story, and thus have a shared tradition with what we find in the earlier Hebrew book of the Exodus. Likewise, the ancient Near Eastern flood accounts are more likely to have shared traditions of a flood that took place in the distant past. As Walton and Longman say, the reader should not jump to the conclusion that the identification of similarities suggests that the author has borrowed information directly from the Mesopotamian accounts. Everyone in the ancient world knows there was a flood, just like everyone today knows there was a holocaust. It is a cultural river. Mesopotamian accounts are drawing out of that cultural river and spinning it according to their cultural ideas and theology. The biblical authors are doing the same. We need not concern ourselves with whether the Israelite authors have access to copies of the Mesopotamian accounts. It is true that Genesis does have parallels found in the other Mesopotamian flood legends, like Gilgamesh. However, Walton and Longman note, we often tend to highlight the similarities and ignore the differences. The reality is, there are more differences between Genesis and the other accounts that really sets Genesis apart. Since there is no evidence of direct literary borrowing 
It is likely the various flood accounts just contain shared traditions of an earlier oral tradition about a flood in the distant past. As Ed Nort says, the extent to which the later narrative is derived from the earlier traditions remains uncertain. A direct form of literary influence cannot be asserted as the distinctive features of the respective narratives are too plentiful to allow such an affirmation. All one can say is that the biblical account must have been influenced by the Mesopotamian oral tradition or by a pre-existing series of such orally transmitted traditions. Another aspect that needs to be considered is the complexity of each account. What we read in Genesis seems to be a far simpler account when we compare it to what we see in Gilgamesh or the Atrahasis, suggesting it was not a further elaboration or dependent on the other versions. Kenneth Kitchen notes, the Genesis account is in no way more evolved. In terms of length, the Genesis account of the flood would equal roughly 120 lines of the Sumerian or Akkadian versions, whereas the Atrahasis flood account was originally at least 370 lines long, and the flood account of Gilgamesh is about 200 lines long. Kitchen says, Genesis 6-8 was probably the simplest and shortest of all ancient versions, possibly originating as early as A, and is certainly not a secondary elaboration on them. If they were just crafting a simplified version, from the existing flood legends, we should expect there to be evidence of redactions or simplifying of specific sections. Instead, we see a simpler flood account that lacks any literary connections to the Mesopotamian versions. We also see less theological development in Genesis and things that would make more practical sense. For instance, both Gilgamesh and Genesis note the flood hero released birds after the flood. In Gilgamesh, the order is a dove, swallow, and then a raven, the last being the largest of the three birds. In Genesis 8, the order is a raven, and then a dove is released three times. In the IVP Bible background commentary, they note the order in Genesis makes more practical sense for surveying the withdrawal of the floodwaters. Unlike pigeons or doves, which will return after being released, a raven's use to the seamen is based on its line of flight. By noting the direction it chooses, a sailor may determine where land is located. The most sensible strategy is to release a raven first and then use other birds to determine the depth of the water and the likelihood of a place to land. A raven by habit lives on carrion and would therefore have sufficient food available. The dove and the pigeon have a limited ability for sustained flight. Thus navigators use them to determine the location of landing sites. As long as they return, no landing is in close range. The dove lives at lower elevations and requires plants for food. So Noah releasing a raven first and then a dove coheres well with ancient seafaring practices. It is likely a raven would be released first to follow the line of direction of dry land. Since it didn't return, that would indicate it may have found a place to rest beyond line of sight signifying the floodwaters were receding. The dove, which is a smaller bird, would have been released next to determine if land masses were nearby, which were not indicated right away. The dove was released again until it did not return, indicating enough dry land had finally appeared. The arc dimensions in Gilgamesh indicate it would have been 120 by 120 by 120 cubits, with six decks and seven floors meaning it likely resembled a giant cube. Such a vessel is unlikely to float and seems to be entirely mythical. We have noted in a previous video, the arc dimensions in Genesis are probably an idealized and exaggerated formula. But even though the dimensions are exaggerated, the ratio of distribution of its walls would more likely be based on an actual vessel that would have been able to float and weather the storm. In other flood legends, the rain lasts for seven days and seven nights, but Genesis indicates a longer time frame of 40 days and 40 nights. For the region to fill with water, seven days seems too short. A longer period would seem more likely to actually create a mega lake in the area. So using a higher symbolic number is a better estimate. Also, the monsoons that used to happen in that region 
typically lasted for about four weeks, which is closer to what Genesis records. So Genesis makes more sense in terms of how long the rain would need to roughly last. Thus, Genesis is a much simpler account and has more elements that seem to be realistic. As Alan Millard says, if judgment is to be passed as to the priority of one tradition over the other, Genesis inevitably wins. In creation, its account is admired for its simplicity and grandeur. Its concept of man accords well with observable facts. Thus, given that there are no literary connections between Gilgamesh and Genesis, like there are between Gilgamesh and Atrahasis, and that the Genesis account is far simpler and realistic, it is unlikely the Hebrews use Gilgamesh as a source. It is more likely all the flood accounts and the similarities within them are the result of shared traditions about a flood that happened in the distant past. Furthermore, the Epic of Gilgamesh appears to have been a fluid text that was meant to be adjusted depending on the time period and culture it was in. This suggests its aim was not necessarily accurate history, but adjusting its content to better suit the audience. We lack evidence to suggest Genesis was treated the same way, and there is a lot of archaeological and historical data that suggests Genesis was aiming more to report accurate accounts of the past. Thus, it doesn't appear with our present knowledge that Genesis was meant to be a fluid text like Gilgamesh. In fact, they seem to be entirely different in their aim, genre, and purpose. And so, there is no reason to assume the Genesis flood was just a myth taken from Gilgamesh or inspired by that flood story. <laughs>